Hello. So I want to talk to you about the way in which the physical and the digital world are coming together. But first, I want to start with a story. My first job out of college, I was actually programming automated warehouses. Now, this was a long time ago. Fire had at least been invented, but it was still a very long time ago. But we were retrofitting the first automated warehouse that had been installed anywhere in the world. And this was a pretty primitive system. To give you an idea of how primitive, the bin full sensor on the racks was the engine overload switch. They would push and push and push. And if the engine tripped, that meant the bin was full. Now, of course, that works well when something heavy is in the bin and you're pushing with something light. Doesn't work so well the other way around. But that was the state of our ability to sense the world in that warehouse. I worked on a second warehouse, which was modern technology for then. And instead of having to give every individual command to raise to the level to, extract, to uh, push out the, the, the lift, lift it up, come back, go. You didn't have to do any of that anymore. You just said, take this thing to this bin. So the moral of this story is these mixed physical digital systems have been around for a long time. But what's happening now is the lines are blurring because our ability to sense the world is so much better. We had even that leap from the first warehouse I did to the second warehouse I did. So the sensors are getting better. Our computers are much faster. That first warehouse I did, we got really excited when they said we could have 8K of memory instead of four. Memory is cheap. Compute is ridiculously fast in comparison to what we had. So our ability to process data from lots of sensors is enormous. And our understanding of what to do with that data is enormous. And that's where this notion of a digital twin comes in. The warehouse system I worked on was a very crude digital twin. It knew where things were going. It could, it could tell things where to go, but that was really the limit of what it could do. So what is a digital twin as we think of it today? A digital twin is a virtual representation of a physical object or a system. Maybe it's a plane, maybe it's a supply chain, maybe it's a city. And it can simulate the behavior of that physical world. Now, that's not something that we did. We just told it where to go on the basis of the commands that we got. But the digital twins now can actually simulate that physical counterpart. That's how good the models have gotten, which means these can also be used for what-if experimentation. We can try out gee, what would happen to my manufacturing process if I reconfigured it this way? And you could figure out whether that improved the flow or not without having to actually reconfigure your manufacturing process. So what kinds of things can we do with digital twins? Well, we can monitor and optimize, and I'm going to give you con more concrete examples, but we can keep track of how something is going and we can make tweaks. And with this what-if experimentation, we can also determine whether or not that tweak did what we wanted it to do. We can do predictive maintenance. This is a big one. Aircraft engines, they can simulate how parts are going to wear out, and then they can monitor actual engines and decide, OK, this thing's going to break next week, so it's time to bring it in for maintenance. You can improve safety by understanding what happens in different situations. You can optimize processes like supply chains 
or manufacturing processes. And you can optimize designs. You can use it to simulate, say, the aerodynamics of an aircraft without actually having to build a mock-up and put it in a chamber. So all of those things are possible because we have the ability to sense the world. And what are the types? A lot of digital twins are built for products. Again, things like an aircraft engine, or maybe it's a, a wearable. Cars, airplanes, maybe it's just the engine of the car. Processes, things in healthcare, things in manufacturing, but also systems. And here I want to highlight the possibility for smart cities. Right now, we have experiments going on in many different cities where sensors are placed, they're monitoring traffic, they're monitoring pedestrian traffic, they're also monitoring electrical usage or energy usage more broadly. And so what we have now is the ability to perhaps change traffic light timings based on an actual simulation of what might be happening in three hours. So this can apply at a granular level, like a watch, or at the scale of a city and everything in between. So what kind of tech do we need to do this? Well, obviously, we need the sensors. And I can tell you that the sensors are a whole lot smarter than the ones that I dealt with oh so many years ago. Some of them are thought of as IoT, but some of them are just basic sensors. Another important one are these actuators. Because if we want to be able to, say, do a what-if simulation, and then make a change in the real world, having actuators allows us to make that change in the physical world based on what we've decided we wanted to do in the virtual world. Simulation and modeling is crucial here because we have to be able to anticipate, OK, this is how this thing in the real world is going to change on the basis of time or on the basis of whatever changes in configuration I've given it. So we have to be able to accurately model what's going on. Visualizations help get that information back to people. And I forgot to mention back in, this, in the sensors, computer vision is a huge part of this and our ability to do image recognition and computer vision. Data analytics, machine learning, all critical. But a big part of this is integration. How do you get all of these different systems, the virtual ones and the physical ones, to actually talk to each other properly, control the flow of information, and not get overwhelmed? And remember, when we're starting to do more of these things automated, machines can respond really quickly, a lot quicker than humans can often respond. And that means you can get yourself into a feedback loop that can actually be quite dangerous. So we need to take advantage of all we've learned about throttling and such and be careful about the integrations. So what are some examples? Well, one of my favorite is in agriculture. So you're a farmer and you have all of this land and we have access to weather reports and we can put sensors in the ground that sense what the soil composition is, how moist the soil is, what stage the plant is in. Maybe you've got drones that are going through and surveying the field. And so you have all of this information and you can run these what if simulations. Okay, if I turn the uh, irrigation system on for this long in this plot, or I put this amount of pesticide or fertilizer, then what will happen? And you decide, hey, that's good. And so you actually then use your actuators to do that. And what are, what are the results? You're probably using a whole lot less water. You're using a lot fewer chemicals, 
which is going to mean you don't have nearly as much runoff to worry about. You're saving money because you're not paying for pesticides and fertilizers or water that you don't need. And your crop productivity is probably going up. And because of our compute capacity, you don't have to do this for an entire field. You can do this for segments of fields. So you can get very precise targeting of, okay, there's an infestation over here, so that's where the pesticide goes, but we don't have to touch over there. So there are already experiments going on in places like India, deploying systems like this. Aerospace. I talked about aircraft engines. We do have some aircraft engine manufacturers that now lease their engines. When you buy the plane, you don't buy an engine with it. You buy a lease of an engine. And the manufacturer of the engine is taking responsibility for the maintenance. And, it's, and they have clauses that mean if the engine fails, it really hurts the engine manufacturer. So they're using these systems to actually simulate how long an engine can be in production. And they're monitoring what's actually happening in the engine. So if maybe they pick up a vibration they weren't expecting, they can try to figure out, okay, what does that mean? And do I need to pull that engine out of service so that it can have maintenance? Medicine. You can think about this for training. We've, we've, we've looked at you know, some of these systems where you have a, an artificial human and a surgeon can practice brain surgery or heart surgery on a mock-up of a human, but it still has to respond as if a human would. You can also think of this in terms of processes. How should I organize my emergency room to allow for it to handle an influx from a critical situation? So there are many different applications across crucial domains that can take advantage of digital twins. So where really is the line? When you start to think about, say, the applications that, that Apple has talked about with the Vision Pro, where you're kind of in your computer and not. I've experienced a visualization where you actually stand inside your data and move it around and stretch it and zoom in. Where is the, this line? we are going to increasingly see these mixed physical and digital systems. And we're going to have to make sure that we have the technology that can protect our cities, our citizens, our patients, our customers from the blurring of this line. Thank you very much.